Welcome to Season 10 of Purposeful Empathy, a show that is dedicated to amplifying the voices of people from across the globe who understand that the world needs more empathy and are doing something about it. I want to thank all of you for watching. Our first 100 episodes garnered over 20,000 organic views. I couldn't do it without you. Please share, please subscribe, and enjoy the show. Welcome to a new episode of Purposeful Empathy. Today I'm joined by the fabulous Linda Crockett, who is a workplace harassment and anti-bullying specialist and founder of the Canadian Institute of Workplace Bullying Resources, which offers a variety of trauma-informed services to support employers, employees, and workplace resources, including investigators, mediators, HR, and insurance companies. She spent 34 years of her career as a social worker and has been a certified and has been working as a certified workplace trauma consultant, coach, and therapist for more than a decade. As a fully recovered witness to and target of workplace harassment and bullying, she is now dedicated to prevention, early intervention, and the promotion of psychological safety for all workers. Welcome to the show, Linda. Hi, thank you very much for having me. I think the work that you do is so important. Unfortunately, we need the work that you do because there are still places of work that are toxic and not safe for everyone, but this has become increasingly salient and important, and I can't wait to have this conversation with you. So maybe you could just start at a very, very baseline level and describe what what workplace bullying is in the first place. Okay. That's a great question to start off with because there's a lot of confusion around what it is and what it isn't. And until we have, you know, training made as a mandatory uh, legislation, part of our legislation, there's going to continue to be confusion around it. So there's research definitions and they all use different languages depending on what country they're from and what's what's their, you know, some languages use incivility, some, some people use bullying, some people use psychological harassment, but let's just say it's all the same thing. But to actually do an investigation and to determine whether bullying has happened, you need to have a basic concept. So that is a variety of of harmful negative tactics, right? So it's not just one time that I roll my eyes at you or one time I slam a door. It does. It never occurs a one time incident. Okay, that is definitely important for people to understand. Bullying is psychological harassment, and it is never a one time thing. So it's a variety of negative behaviors, whether it's verbal, nonverbal, you know, uh, indirect through another person, a variety of negative behaviors, actions with or without conscious intent. So a lot of mistakes are being made with that one. So, no, it's with or without conscious intent directed towards a person or group of people over a period of time. And research will say just typically six months or more, but because of the growing awareness that we have in our world today, you know, with the Me Too movement in 2018 and exposure over social media, people are becoming more educated and aware. It's now out of the closet. It's not keeping people silent in shame any longer. Because of that growing awareness, I would say three months or more is very safe gauge and you need a gauge. You can't You can't just say, you know, uh, two weeks, three weeks here. You've got to have kind of a gauge. Consistency wise, I'm seeing valid cases of three months or more. But it's important to say prior to three months or prior to six months, it's still unacceptable behavior. And these are your warning signs that we all typically ignore and need to stop ignoring. That is the abrasive meanness, rudeness, uh, incivility that we talk about. That is those things people blow off as, oh, it's a personality conflict. Don't do that anymore. You know, don't say, oh, that's just the way they are. That is you neglecting early warning signs. And if you ignore them, it's going to progress to psychological harassment. If you ignore that, it's going to progress to psychological violence. Mm. And could you speak to what the injuries are like for people who have lived and experienced workplace um, harassment or bullying? I can. The injuries will vary with individuals, but there's some very common denominators. I mean, it's kind of like a domino effect. We're all human. I think the first thing to go is our sleep. 
because that's the one place where we think and remember and we have peace and quiet. We're not interrupted. And we start thinking about what just happened. Did that happen? Did they say that? I can't believe this. I'm so confused. You know, so you're in your sleep. You can't get to sleep or else you wake up at three in the morning and you start ruminating about what's going to happen today. You know, how am I going to protect myself? Or what do I say if they do this? So the first thing to go is your sleep. That's the first injury. Now, when you're showing up at work, you're fatigued. And with that comes loss of focus, loss of concentration. And with that comes a sense of not safety. I am now feeling anxious. And with anxiousness and anxiety, you're starting to feel vulnerable. And with your vulnerability, you start to isolate because you don't feel safe any longer. Your psychological safety is gone because these tactics are happening over, over time. So now with anxiety, if we don't treat that, this could end up in a panic attack. Again, vulnerability. Now you're even more afraid. And along with that comes depression, self-doubt, self-negative talk. You start to wonder, did I see that? Did I hear that? Did they really say that? Because along with all that, you've got your, your colleagues who are, you know, blinded, see no evil, speak no evil, hear no evil, not getting involved. So your self-doubt can be dis disabling. And with that, you end up, depending on where you carry your stress, some of us, myself included, ended up with gastrointestinal problems, you know, ulcers. IBS, Crohn's disease, diverticulitis, these kinds of things can show up if you're someone who carries it in the cardiac system, high blood pressure, stroke, and we are seeing people with heart attacks and strokes, even premature death due to heart attack because of bullying has been proven and accepted by WCB, Workers' Compensation Board, you know, or, or premature death due to suicide. So, we are seeing those cases as well in the migraines, TMJ, pain in here, um, autoimmune systems being lowered. So more flus, more colds, more viruses. The, the list goes on, you know, eczema outbreaks, diagnoses of, of chronic depression, uh, PTSD right through. So the gamut, depending on how long you're exposed to it. And also depends on you as a person too. If you're someone who thinks that you can fix it, like I was, and just work harder, work longer hours, do more, prove to them I'm the best, and I, I you know, put my health at risk by doing that, end up with burnout, you'll end up with uh, severe, I ended up with PTSD as a result of what I went through. And you never can fix it, by the way. <laughs> okay, so all of that sounds really terrible. And uh, <laughs> I can think of a boss in particular that you're probably describing some things that I went through, because I remember sleeping at night sort of like wheel spinning thinking 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 I remember waking up my jaws were always clenched because I'd been like grating my teeth anyways I read a Brene Brown book and and finally got over him but um <laughs> I, wa <laughs> I want to ask you okay so a, a very uh, hard fact question that you may have access to and then maybe on a more personal basis it, it this is not happening to like a couple of people um can you give a sense of how how pervasive this is in the workforce? And then also, would you mind indulging, not indulging, but would you mind sharing um, your own experience? Because I think that for viewers and listeners, it's useful to hear what your personal experience was to kind of bring it to concrete if they don't have sure. their own lived experience. Sure. Well, how pervasive is it? I would say it's an epidemic. Mm -hmm. I would say in 2008, when I hit rock bottom, uh, it was being called an epidemic then by other specialists. And then I would say when I developed my own speciality years later and 12 years later now after running this business, it's continuing to be an epidemic. Mm -hmm. And I think with building awareness, we're going to see those numbers. We know it's an epidemic because look at the, the statistics and the cost on society, taxpayers, the medical system. The, the legal system, the insurance system, multiple millions, multiple billions are being quoted every year because we're not doing the right thing. That's all it is. We're not doing the right thing. If we did the right thing, we would have millions of dollars to put to areas that really need it. You know what I mean? Just basically do the right thing. Treat, you know, don't abuse. 
But uh, in my own story, I was 22 years into social work when this happened to me. So if you think about it, I had 22 years of experience of helping other people who were abused. I was uh, in domestic violence. I was in working with sexual assault. I was working in addictions. I was working in child abuse. So I had exposure to all kinds of abuse. I was an investigator and an assessor. I was a supervisor and I trained people on how to assess and identify abuse. And yet at the 22 year mark, when I hit rock bottom, I literally uh, had no idea what was happening to me. Because in 2008, where I am, nobody was talking about it. Nobody trained you. Nobody gave you language to identify it. And it was so normalized that everybody just, you know, it, it, you saw it, but you didn't do anything about it because it's so normalized. And so it was like waking up out of this cobweb and going, wow, that's wrong. You, we can't do this to people. So I did my research. There's plenty of researchers doing this for years, long and long years before I even awoken to what this was. And uh, when I was injured, I was stubborn. I was, I'm a tenacious Scots woman. I'm going to prove to them that I'm the best worker they ever had. So I, I, like many of my clients, by the way, hung in there and thought I could fix it. So I worked longer hours, like I said, and I came in on weekends. I did my best. I bent over backwards to prove to them that I was a good, worthy employee. And they would get off my back. They would leave me alone and I could do the job I love. Well, the shock was the, the harder I worked, the better I was, the worse the abuse got. I never thought for a minute that it was because I was a threat or I was good at what I did. So the better I got, the worse it got. I thought it was like childhood bullying, you know, the, the meek or the mild ch kids, the one that's getting bullied. I thought there was something wrong with me. When I realized it was actually the opposite in the workplace bullying, it's usually the ones who are very dedicated, very loyal, go above and beyond the call of duty, very skilled and very liked. Uh, they're, we're the ones that are getting targeted. That's typical. I've been I've seen thousands in the last 12 years, 100 percent across the board. Every one of them's got those characteristics. And so I hung in there far too long and I could bear I lost so much weight. I, I was just as thin as I was sickly. I was losing my hair. I was, I had chronic GERD, acid reflux. I could barely talk. I had ulcers in my stomach and I ended up with a, a permanent diagnosis and I ended up with PTSD. So I hung in there way too long. I just, there was no one to talk to. Nobody knew about this. So, so what if, just, I don't mean to interrupt you for a second, but just like, okay, for any, for any skeptics or anybody listening, who's like cluing in for the first time, what does it sound like? Because some people might say, well, you were just, you had a demanding boss or you had a demanding workplace where, you know, things were the high expectations, high performance culture. So what does it sound like when it's not that? So, well, what do you mean? What, did, what happened? What were the actual tactics? Is that what you're asking? I guess. Yeah. I don't, I don't, yeah. If, if tactics yeah. is the right way to frame it. Yeah. Yeah. So what is it? What is what it started with was uh, for the first six months of this job, I was praised. I felt really safe. I felt really comfortable. Um, unfortunately, my mother was dying at that time. So I took some time off to be with her at her side. But because and that time was always approved and supported. But when she the minute she died, I mean, day after I was brought into the office and I was told that nobody liked me. They didn't think I was trustworthy, that I wasn't reliable because I wasn't there. So for six months, I thought I was fully supported. And then boom, I'm blasted, side blast, side blasted that the staff don't like me. Who doesn't like me? So who's been stabbing me in the back? Because they're all saying, good morning, Linda. Are you okay? They're, they look great. They thought I thought they were really phenomenal. Now, I don't know where who's safe. I don't know who's got the knife in my back. And she, the person that did this to me, had been wonderful for six months. So it was Jekyll and Hyde or Godzilla versus Mary Poppins, whatever you want to put it. So she shocked me. I couldn't believe she could talk like that. And then I didn't know who was safe. So I spent the next six months working overtime, proving myself, proving myself and, and burning myself out. Then I was accused of lying about overtime. It was 40 hours of overtime that she had approved, but only verbally. So when it came time to pay me out, there was a big fight about it. I, had, I was interrogated. I was, it was like torture 
every minute had to be accounted for. And then it turned out that the administrative person had made a mistake in calculations. So I'd spent a week of sleepless nights wondering how I was going to get through this interrogation that went on forever. And they ended up being the ones who were wrong. Never apologized, but I'm worn out now and I'm grieving. And they knew that. Uh, in addition to that, the manager, who, by the way, was a psychologist, would walk down the hallway every day and say good morning to everyone but me and completely ignore me. I'd be right there. You know, I'm only five foot one, but you can still see me. He's six foot. And I'd walk right by him and say good morning to everyone but me. Now, it's like death by a thousand cuts. So that's a little thing. But if you keep getting these cuts by that supervisor and that, that manager, and then it became the HR person, cut after cut after cut, when you're working hard to prove yourself and you can never do anything right, Another example is sitting in my supervisor's office and she's giving, you know, we're having a good conversation, which made me late for a patient, 10 minutes late. Uh, after that patient left, I'm reprimanded for being 10 minutes late by the actual supervisor that I just had a meeting with. Mm -hmm. uh, another example is uh, we had a meeting and we all booked our holidays. I didn't have any time left. So I said, whatever long weekends are available, I'll take them at a day on. But you obviously I'm last on the priority list. So if you need them, you take them. So they're marked up three or four days later. I'm sitting in front of the supervisor. The calendar's behind her head and she's screaming at me, spitting and saying, who the heck do I think I am for picking all those long weekends? And I said, but you we had this discussion. You understood that. And she says, no, we did not have that discussion. I, but the calendar's right behind her head. I can see it. She said, we never had that discussion. You're lying to me. And did you just call me unprofessional? Wow. And like her eyes are bugging. And I'm thinking, I never even thought you were unprofessional. How could I have said that? And now she's being, she's in accusing me. She darts up, crosses the hall, goes into the manager's door, shuts it, slams it. So I know she's in there talking about me. She's making all this stuff up. I'm being gaslit. I'm being crazy. It's making me crazy. And she comes out of there three minutes laughing. So she went in there raging and came out laughing. And what's the message to me? Mm -hmm. So I saw that pattern happen a few times. And I realized, oh, my goodness, he's trained her to do that. Mm -hmm. He's teaching them. Mm -hmm. uh, another example is he brought us all into the office one at a, one at a time and said, I want you to spy on so-and-so. Mm -hmm. And then I, the other one would spy on so-and-so, and I want you to come back. Well, you walk out that office and you go, so who's spying on me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it was cut after cut after cut after cut, even to the point where it could have cost my life one day because I had a patient coming in and I had chest pains and pains going down my arm and my throat felt funny. And I knew about female heart attacks. We're a little bit different. And I walked into my uh, manager's office and I told him, I said, I've got a patient, but I'm having chest pains and I'm quite panicked about it. I think I should go to the hospital. And he turned his back to me and he says, well, I don't have time right now, but I'll talk to you on Tuesday. This was Thursday. I said, I have a patient in my office. Somebody needs to deal with the patient. I need to go. And he said, Linda, he argued with me. And I said, you know what? This is actually making me worse. So I went in and I took the patient. When I left with that patient, he shut down the building. Everyone was, everyone had left. All the lights were out and locked up. I was alone in that building with that patient. He didn't know if I'd had a heart attack in that room or not. Mm -hmm. So when I walked out of that room and realized what he'd done, I realized he could actually let me just die right in front of a patient. Something you said early in my first question caught my attention uh, that I want to circle back to, which is it's whether it's conscious or not. 
right? So we have this impression that workplace bullying has to be that the person knows they're being really evil and they're being really like manipulative or they're being really, really hard. And you're saying people, some people might not know that they're behaving this way, but it still doesn't cut them off. It, it, it doesn't, you know, forgive the behavior. Yeah. Oh, I love that you asked that question because it's important. You know, you have the spectrum of bully types. Okay. So you have... On the right end of that spectrum is your psychological violence type of bullies. That's your narcissist, psychopath, sociopath. And they're absolutely very much aware that they're out to get you. For whatever reason, maybe they don't know, but they're out to get you. That is deliberate. They're consciously aware. They exist. They are not the majority type, in my professional opinion. They're not the majority type. But there's many of them out there. If you look at the statistics on psychopaths and sociopaths in our society, somewhere between 4 and 5% of our population. So do the math. You know you probably worked with one. So they're on that right end of that spectrum. But the rest of them, I know this because I work with them after an investigation substantiates that a man or a woman is, has been bullying or psychologically harassing. They are sent to me by an employer who says, I like this guy or I like this woman. They're skilled. I want to keep them, but they must change these behaviors. So I'm referring them to you. We're covering the costs. But if they don't show up, they're fired. Mm. So they are sent to me. So I get to work with these people and I get to understand part of the best work I do, by, by the way, because I get to see through the, the layers of callous skin that they've built over the years that cuts them off from their original sense of self. We have this moral gauge, I believe. We are all born with it, unless you're a psychopath, sociopath. You know, we're born with it. And I think that when you get away with it for so long, you disconnect from that moral gauge. And why are some of them like that? Some of them have been born into homes where there was, you know, chaos, abuse, domestic violence, addictions, um, multiple partners, and they're at higher risk of being a bully or bullied in the workplace. Some of them are bullied in the school. So they're going to turn it on other people. They're at higher risk. Some of them have mental health issues that have never been diagnosed, and they simply need to be diagnosed and treated. Some of them were actually trained to be abusive, uh, maybe the authoritarian leadership style, and they abuse their power. You know, So they've been trained. They've been hired because they're that way. They've been promoted, rewarded time after time and protected layer after layer after layer after layer of disconnection from that moral gauge. I've had a couple of uh, identified bullies come to me who are absolutely shocked that the way they were trained was wrong, that they were hurting people. And when we finally get through to that heart, devastated, emotional breakdown and changes are made. Mm -hmm. I've had a bully that had a mental health issue, a physical health issue. In addition to that, um, leaders were bullying him. In addition to that, there was no support, no HR and no policies. Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of reasons, you know, whether you have a mental health issue, borderline personality disorder, uh, bipolar disorder, it's important that you get the treatment, but it's, you're never, it's never acceptable for you to be abusive. You well, know? It sounds like, at least that's how I feel like I'm leaning into this is that, um, if people are conscious or not of their own bullying behavior in the workplace, because there might be a reason for it that exists from childhood or, or other, all the things that you just described, there's still a window to have empathy for those folks. And you're saying that your work is kind of helping them unlock some things. You know, when you're talking about trauma-informed coaching and therapy, it, it's it's knowing that hurt people ha are have been hurt themselves and there's a way of freeing them from that so that they can become um you know all they can be right yeah but first we must make them accountable so yeah. absolutely there's explanations and explanations help us gain some empathy but they must be accountable that means admit it and get some help Otherwise, there won't be any restoration. There won't be any repair in the workplace. It'll come back on somebody else. So obviously, we can't change psychopaths and sociopaths or narcissists, true blue narcissists, but we certainly can change the others. You know, we have neuroplasticity today that says no more excuses. If you're 
you know, a member of the old boys club or the old girls club and you say, you know, hey, I'm 60, I'm not going to change now. I call BS on that because we have neuros <laughs> neuroplasticity that can tell us, oh, yes, you can change. Mm -hmm. So employers, leaders, staff must make these people accountable. And we do that by taking notes, gathering evidence and filing a complaint and following through on your policies. Okay, before we get into some of the training that you do, because I think I, I, that's very important to explore and why you think training is so important within organizations. Um, what about bystanders? I think you have quite a bit to say about people who observe workplace culture and workplace bullying and what happens to them as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it, it, there's, there's uh, a lot of People, I came, I came to a place of understanding about bystanders when I realized, you know, I've been a bystander who spoke up and I've been a bystander who's not spoke up. Either way, I got bullied as a result. But, you know, I, I was very, very angry with my bystander because she was a master's of social work. She has an obligation to report abuse and she knew there was abuse happening and she didn't. So I was angry. Even though I knew she had a fear of conflict, um, I felt that she needed to deal with her fear of conflict in order to do the right thing. So I started to process this and I came to realize, you know what, bystanders suffer too. And bystanders have very good reasons for not speaking up. Some of them join the bullies and I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about the ones who do nothing. And I wanna validate that they have good reasons for it, number one, They've seen the process fail time and time again, and it has. So why would you put yourself in a line of fire? I get that. Some of them have been bullied before, and they don't want to be bullied again. I get that. Some people don't know what to do, so we can change that with training. Some people have already been overwhelmed with their work. I get that. Some people are overwhelmed at work, and they might have a sick child at home. They might have a sick wife or husband at home. They might have a sickness themselves. We get all that. There's many good reasons for them not wanting to speak up. So we need to open up a service. We need to open up a safe place for them to come and talk about it and process it and develop a strategy that makes it safe for them to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Another one is some people are on probation and they need that permanent position. They need the health benefits because they got a sick kid at home. So we understand they don't speak up during that three months or six months. Talk to somebody about it and find the way that will work for you to do the right thing because you are the most important part of, of a case in proving that it's happened and creating change. Mm. And you feel that um, workers need to fight the urge to give in to shame and silence. Could you tell us more about that? Well, shame and silence feeds the bullies. It's giving them the food they want. That's all. They want you to shrink. They want you to diminish. They want you to go away in some way, shape, or form. So maybe that's just isolation. You know, so I realized that when I was in my office hiding, because uh, I, I sat there thinking about this isn't working. This is making me sick, right? Isolating is not who I am. And I started to realize, you know what? Doctors sometimes don't see symptoms in their own children. Uh, police officers still get their children ar arrested. Just because I'm a professional social worker doesn't mean I'm not a human being. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, the shame of thinking I should have seen it, I should have known it. How could this happen to someone like me? All of that shame kept me quiet. Well, guess who wins? Certainly not me. So I decided I'm going to do the exact opposite. I'm going to open up and I'm never going to shut up. And, and I haven't shut up for 12 years. So this is what the answer is. The silence and shame feeds them. You know, so let's talk about it and remove shame as the barrier for you doing the right thing, getting help. Now, what about another angle altogether? What about people who are falsely accused? People mm. who are accused of bullying behavior or some other form of harassment, and they actually haven't done anything wrong. Oh, yeah. Those cases really fascinate me because I have had, uh, that's down to a number of things, lack of education on the leadership side that has accused this person, <laughs> excuse me, and lack of trauma-informed training for the investigator. <laughs> or picking an investigator who's already got a bias. 
So we, we really need to have standards in place for investigations to protect all parties, to make sure that they're trauma-informed, to make sure they understand the nuances, insidiousness, new, insidious nuances and complexities of this, and also that there's absolutely no, no room, no chance of bias in their investigations. Because being falsely accused causes an injury as well, right? <laughs> it creates a lack of safety for that person. I've had a woman come to me who, uh, who was accused, who had an investigation, and it was substantiated that she was bullying. And when I fully assessed her, there was not a molecule of bullying in this woman's body. And, and so I went to bat for her to advocate that that investigation needed to be reviewed and needed to be redone by somebody who was qualified to do this kind of investigation. And so I, I wrote letters on her behalf. And uh, it, unfortunately, laws today, if the employer says, nope, it's not in our policies to override an investigation, nope, we won't do a second appeal, nope. You know, there's no laws for that. So it, it stood up. And of course, she was hurt and damaged by that. But my assessment alone of her, i tell you what the problem was. She was confident. The mm -hmm. problem was she was assertive. And there was a couple of dysfunctional employees who didn't understand that, didn't like that, were threatened by that and accused her. So two things went wrong there. The actual bullies won. The investigator made a mistake. Mm -hmm. She's doing great today, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you were there to advocate for her. And so I think as a cautionary message, you remind leaders that employees are watching uh, and how they manage how they manage these kinds of cases like matters, right? They, people know when an organization's leadership is being authentic or not. Um, and we, you know, you mentioned earlier at the beginning, it can be very expensive uh, uh, to have a toxic workplace. So what do you want leaders like the c-suite leaders and the line managers to understand um you know what, uh, about this what can they do differently well they need to understand that this is not going away they need to understand that this is not just some little childhood stuff this is serious it's causing serious harm serious danger and costing lives and, you know one day it might be your own wife it might be your own daughter so don't you know think about that for a second this is not going away. One day you might be identified as the bully and exposed on social media. That's what we're seeing that's happening out there. One day you might be falsely accused or rightfully accused. It's coming. Your employees are watching. They, they are seeing whether you're genuine, bought into this, or just surface, check the old box, one hour webinar. And if that's the case, then they're not trusting. They're not believing, they're not staying. They're not feeling safe. You know, they're they're certainly not committed to to the environment as much as they would be. If they knew that you had their backs, you've got great policies, you're following through on it, you're making sure everybody's trained, everybody's aware, and the topic doesn't go away. It doesn't get hidden under the carpet, let elephants in the room nobody's talking about. If you've got that environment, that healthy environment, you've got people committed, productivity's improved, their reputation is excellent and you're saving money. I don't know why you don't want that, but what we're seeing is the opposite. Okay, so you just made the business case for this, but what does training actually look like? Because you just said it's not the one hour webinar and it's not like you can send every person for long uh, three year trauma training. You know, so what's the in between? What's the, what is the training look like? Well, you know, if we're talking about, let's say for investigators, you don't need to become a psychologist to be trauma informed investigator. If it's HR leadership, all frontline first responding, first responding professionals should, it should be mandatory that you have trauma informed training. That does not mean you need to know, be a psychologist. It means one day. It can mean a half day. I prefer a one day because, and same for staff, by the way, same for staff, that you need the language to identify this correctly. You need to understand what it is, what it isn't so that you're not falsely accusing or making mistakes. And you know, like today, everything is bullying, where 10 years ago, nothing was bullying. With training will find us that middle that we need, you know? Um, it will prevent further harm because then you're not saying the wrong things to those people. You're not minimizing, you're not blaming them. You're not saying, don't be so sensitive. You're understanding the issue. 
So training is, is one day. The morning would be, what is it? What does it look like? What does it feel like? And I give a holistic perspective to my training. It's not just through a corporate lens. It's through the human lens. So the, the leadership, how does it impact them? The target, how does it impact them? The bystander, how do we support the bystander? The offenders, what types are they and why is it happening? And what is the impact of physically and psychologically, and as well as characteristics and profiles and prevalence, all of that is the morning. And then a video that sums it all up. The afternoon is all about what to do about it. So we talk about legislation, we talk about company policies, but we also talk, talk about the Joint Health and Safety Committee, what are the resources out there, what you can do about it as in far as documenting. Documenting is not just for the investigation, it's for your mental health as well. We talk about the investigation process and we talk about what the other options are out there, the internal and external uh, resources. We talk about that as well. And then self-care, of course, what you can do to empower yourself and what you can do to heal with, you know, my say statement is always choose recovery with or without justice. Don't wait for justice to show up before you decide to take care of yourself. Because what does that say about your self-worth? So we have a responsibility to take care of ourselves as well. And uh, so it covers everything, really, in one day. I wanted to have this conversation with you because um, there's so much conversation now about empathic leadership and empathic workplaces. I wonder what you think, where's the thread of empathy through all of this that we're talking about? Well, you know, what I would say is emotional intelligence should be the foundation for every leader. So, you know, when I teach leaders, I always ask them this question, what is your leadership style? And I always get the deer in the headlights look consistently. So if you don't know what your leadership style is, how do you know if you're effective? So I, I say, get, take a course on leading with emotional intelligence. That should be your very, very foundation. And then pull on other leadership styles, because then you're going to understand the, how this is impacting you, what your strengths are, trust your judgment, trust your intuition. And um, that was the beginning of my answer. So tell me what the rest of your question was, because I lost it. <laughs> how do you think empathy is thread through Thank your you. work? Yeah. Thank you. So that's part of emotional intelligence, right? So empathy, putting one foot into another person's shoes. Keep one foot in your own foot, in your own shoe, because you don't want to lose yourself in that in that role. But empathy is putting your finding something in your life that is similar to what they're feeling, not necessarily the dynamics or the context, but what they're feeling. And just be there with them, be there in it and say, you know, I never saw that, but that must have been really difficult for you. You know, you don't have to be there to provide empathy and validation, but that is a golden that is a golden uh, piece of support that you can give to them. But if you over empathize and you lose your sense of self, you're at high risk of burnout. So there's a skill of empathy that you need to learn, but it's critical in these cases. You know, for myself, at, when I told you I hit rock bottom, I went to five therapists and the first four actually made me worse because they didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know this injury. They didn't understand it. And they triggered me and made me worse. It was the fifth one that actually helped me. And that's because she just listened and she provided empathy. And that settled my nervous system. I didn't have to fear that she th was gonna think I was crazy or judge me or blame me. She was just gonna let me feel safe and I could share my story and feel heard and supported. That was gold. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to ask a final question, um, which I love to ask of all my guests. It always ends on a bit of a sweet note, I find, um, even though I never know what uh, someone will share. Um, you know, I call it purposeful empathy, right? Having empathy on purpose, right? Extending empathy, practicing empathy on purpose, knowing that you can uh, do that. I wonder if there's a time in your life, uh, big, small, medium, recent, long time ago, doesn't matter, when you were on the receiving empathy, uh, receiving end of empathy, um, and what that meant for you. Well, the example I just shared is one of the life-changing, life-saving moments. And it was a skill of just being present and, and, and intently 
looking at me and seeing and, and making me feel seen and heard. That saved my life, in my opinion. And that changed my career right there. I knew then what I needed to be doing. There have been other moments in my life where perhaps I've lost a loved one and I'm grieving. The words didn't help me. It was them just putting their hand on my arm. That was it. That was a moment of feeling, wow, mm. you know, just no words, just empathy. That hand went on my arm. They didn't try to fix it. No silver lining. No, you know, cliches. Just I'm with you. Mm. Ooh, I'll never forget that moment. Mm. Well, we're going to have so much information available in the, um, the episode description, especially to reach out to the Canadian Institute of Workplace Bullying Resources and your training. I just want to thank you so much, Linda, for the work that you do and the time you took to have this conversation today. I really think since we spend, you know, 40 plus hours a week at work, if you multiply that out over your lifetime, we need to get this right. We need to have places where we can feel psychologically safe and valued so that we can flourish as professionals and do the work that needed in the world so thank you thank you i appreciate you we'll see you next time at purposeful empathy thank you for watching another episode of purposeful empathy remember this show is dedicated to amplifying the voices of people from across the globe who understand that the world needs more empathy and are doing something about it if you want to get involved share this video, subscribe to this channel. See you next week. Thank you so much.